Ayala learning Knichtas. Welcome to this series of videos in which we will explore the cultural contacts between early medieval England, Northern Africa and the Middle East. With these videos, we hope to give you some interesting examples of intercultural contact between the East, the West and the early Middle Ages. When you think of early medieval Britain, you might imagine it as an isolated place on the edge of a map separated from the rest of the world by the North Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. However, early medieval Britain was never really an isolated place, and there were a lot of cultural contacts between England and the rest of the world. Just look at some of these recent headlines that demonstrate that Anglo-Saxon graves were furnished with materials from many faraway places, including garnets from Sri Lanka, elephant ivory from Africa, and bitumen from Syria. All of these materials ended up in England through trade, often via the Middle East and the famous Silk Road. In this video, Fatima al Mufridi and I will discuss three such materials that testify to the rich interactions between early medieval England and the rest of the world, notably the Middle East. These materials are coins, cloth, notably silk, and condiments or exotic spices. Take it away, Fatima, or should I say, show me the money? I will gladly show you the money. In fact, take a look at this curious coin made in England in the 8th century. This coin was made for the English king Offa of Mercia, whose name is written here in Latin script as Offa Rex. What makes this particular coin so special is that there is also a different kind of script on it, a less familiar script, Arabic, or to be more precise, Kufic script. If you look closely at this spot, it reads La ilaha illallah, which is part of the Muslim Shahada indicating there is no God but Allah. And this bit is supposed to read Wahduhu la sharika la, which means he, Allah, has no partner. Now, what is going on here? Well, Offa's English coin is believed to be based on a dinar issued by the Abbasid Caliph Al Mansur, who reigned around the same time as Offa. The two coins clearly look similar, don't they? But if you look carefully, you can see that there are minor errors in the Arabic script, which indicate that the Anglo-Saxon die cutter could not really read Arabic. For example, on the Alpha Rex side of the coin, you can see that the Arabic Muhammad Rasulullah, which means Muhammad is the messenger of God, has been copied upside down in a less legible script. The Anglo-Saxon die cutter also clearly messed up the Arabic writing around the edge of the coin, and may have thought it was merely some form of decoration. But why would Offa make a coin that looked like this dinar, along with an attempt at the Muslim Shahada? After all, he is unlikely to have converted to Islam. Instead, this imitation dinar probably reflects the prestige of actual Arabic coins that were widely used for international trade during the early Middle Ages. In fact, Many such Arabic coins have been found in early medieval England. As a simple search for Arabic coin in the database of the Portable Antiquity Scheme reveals. Just look at all these Arabic dirhams found in early medieval England. According to Rory Naismith, no fewer than 173 gold and silver Islamic coins minted before 1100 are known to have been discovered in England. These coins likely originate from the Middle East, Northern Africa, Spain, and other regions. Many of these coins, or dirhams, were found in English areas that were controlled by Vikings, who had far-stretching trade networks. According to Mariana Fedele, the Viking traders tapped into the Eurasian trade network known as the Silk Road, which was used to export various luxuries from Asia into Europe via the Middle East. One such luxury gave its name for the trading network silk, and it's to this trading item that we now turn. Textiles made of silk made their way into Europe from East and Central Asia via the so-called Silk Road. There are plenty of examples of silk materials that entered late Anglo-Saxon England via Viking trading networks that included the Middle East and the Silk Road. A good example is this silk cap, dating to around the year 1000 found in Viking York. But even before the Vikings, silk materials were a hit among Anglo-Saxon elites. For example, 
the relics of Anglo-Saxon saints were sometimes wrapped in exquisite and exotic silk textiles. The example here comes from the 8th or 9th century and was used to wrap the relics of the Anglo-Saxon missionary saint Lebwinus or Leofwina. But silk did not only suit the relics of dead people. Luxurious silk clothing was also a bit of a fashion item for aristocratic elites and became associated with high royal status. As such, silk was deemed unsuitable for religious clerics. The Anglo-Saxon monk and scholar Alcuin, for instance, was known to criticize his religious countrymen for wearing silk and suggested that they go humbly dressed instead. Do not let them wear gold ornaments or silk clothes in the king's sight. They should go humbly dressed as befits servants of God. Similarly, an anonymous Old English homilist reminded his flock that Nas na mit golde ne mit god webenum chrachlum ak mit godum dadum and halchum we sholon beon ye fratwot. We should not at all be adorned by gold and silk garments, but with good and holy deeds. Of course, the fact that there was a need for such a statement to be made suggests that exotic silks may have remained quite popular throughout the Anglo Saxon period. Indeed, even clerics would send one another silk clothes as a gift, as the following example from a letter by the 8th century missionary Boniface to one of his friends reveals. Meanwhile, I sent to you letters and small gifts as a token of pure love, namely a cloak, not of pure silk, but mixed with goat's wool and a towel for drying your feet. Apparently, unlike Alcuin, Boniface thought that silk clothing would not look too bad on a bishop. We can only agree. Another luxury trading item that would have entered England via trading networks that reached to the Middle East and beyond was exotic spices. Like silk, these spices made excellent gifts, as once again we can tell from a number of letters by and to the 8th century missionary Boniface, which recounts gifts of incense, cinnamon, pepper and frankincense, all sorts of spices that were not really native to England but came from distant places. We are sending you, as a token of sincere affection and of our blessing, a napkin with a little incense. Though we cannot repay you in kind, still we send in exchange of loving remembrance four ounces of cinnamon, four ounces of costumery, two pounds of pepper and one pound of kazumba. A little gift of blessing as a souvenir of our friendship. Cinnamon, spice, pepper, and incense in a sealed packet. It is not just Boniface who sent to receive these exotic spices. It appears to have been a broader phenomenon within his circle. For instance, when his disciples Denehard, Lulus, and Burkhard wrote to the abbess Kuniburg, they sent along some spices. Some little gifts accompany this letter. Frankincense, pepper, and cinnamon. A very small present but given out of heartfelt affection. Another instance of pepper and incense being gifted comes to us from a letter written by a monk called Cuthbert, who reports on the death of the Venerable Bede, another famous Anglo-Saxon monk. According to Cuthbert, Bede was ill and on his deathbed and asked Cuthbert to round up his students for a final exchange of gifts. Cuthbert reports Bede's words as follows. I have a few treasures in my box, some pepper, and napkins, and some incense. Run quickly and fetch the priests of our monastery, and I will share among them such little presents as God has given me." Cuthbert did as Bede had asked, and Bede handed out his valuable spices. To make the scene even more dramatic, Bede even broke into a song. For a tham neid fara nani wirthit, thongs not turra, thonim tharfsia, to im hudjanna ar his hinyonga, but his gasta, God as Atha Uflas, after Delft Daya, do mit Welta. Wow. I guess that's one way to spice up an awkward situation. That wraps up this video. Thank you, Fatima, and thank you, Bede, for giving us all something to think about. 
All these traces of trade make clear that there was quite some contact between early medieval England and the rest of the world. If you enjoyed this video, please check out our other videos on cultural contact between early medieval England, Northern Africa and the Middle East. This video was made possible by Leiden University's Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Fund.